everyone. Welcome to this uh, session, session number 49 of the Porous Media Tea Time Talks. Uh, my name is Marcel Moura, and I'm joined here in the studio today by my two friends, uh, Catherine Spurring and Madi Mansouri. And uh, together with the others of the team, we welcome you all for this session today. This is a little bit later than our usual time, and that's because we shifted the time zones a little bit to be a bit uh, kinder to the uh, speakers in the US. And uh, we're having two speakers today. And uh, uh, the first one is uh, Zoe Canavas. Uh, she's a PhD candidate in water resources and engineering at the University of California, Davis. Uh, her research is focused on the fundamental physics that drive groundwater flow at extremely small scales, employing computational fluid dynamics, statistical analysis, and machine learning. She holds a master's in water resources and engineering from the University of California, Davis and a dual bachelor's in geological engineering and geophysics from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So Zoe, uh, if you're ready there, we can have your slides on the screen. The floor is yours. Great. Hello, everyone. My name is Zoe, and I'm about to finish my PhD at the University of California, Davis, where I have been working under Professor Veronica Morales. And today, I'll be describing the work that I've been doing for my dissertation titled Flow Phenomena Under Poor Scale Spatial Heterogeneity in Geologic Media. Before jumping in, I want to thank my advisor and collaborators for the immense help not only on this work, but being a support system during my graduate experience. I also want to acknowledge the funding sources, the ACS Petroleum Research Fund, NSF, and the AXA Research Fund. The main objective of my research is to quantitatively link the structural heterogeneity of porous media structures at the pore scale to observed flow, transport, and reaction patterns. So I'm sure everyone here is familiar, the environmental and industrial applications of work in this field are quite broad, but I see my research as being most applicable to improve models for groundwater remediation, oil and gas recovery, and long-term carbon storage solutions. To better understand flow through porous media at small scales, my work has generally tackled two major questions. What controls flow and what does flow control? To talk about what controls flow, uh, we wanna make a more direct connection between the flow and structure. And so I first sought to simplify the flow field by quantifying the flow heterogeneity and to simplify the pore space structure by recasting it into a pore network model via graph theory. To simplify our porous media, we're going to represent it as an equivalent network. Let's consider this example of a binary porous medium where gray is the solid and white is the pore space. We will first convert the pore space into its topological skeleton, and then we'll split that skeleton into nodes and edges, where edges are the channels and channel intersections are the nodes. After identifying the nodes and edges, we record the channel geometric information, like the arc length and the pore throat, which is the minimum width in a channel, uh, as well as the topological information, like the neighboring nodes and edges. Now we move to flow heterogeneity. While there is no agreed upon metric to quantify flow heterogeneity, we sought to propose one in our publication from 2021 and termed it percolation threshold. Beginning with the Eulerian flow field, the percolation threshold divides it into mobile and immobile flow regions. Mathematically, it's defined as the ratio between the minimum velocity in the mobile region relative to the average velocity of the sample. This velocity threshold is set at the first established path that connects the inlet to the outlet. This is also called the percolating path and is shown in red. Velocities lower than this threshold are put into the immobile region and velocities greater than this threshold are in the mobile region. A small percolation threshold indicates a homogeneous flow field and a large percolation threshold indicates a heterogeneous flow field. Now we will combine our simplified conceptions of the pore structure and flow field through shortest path analysis. To find the shortest path through a graph, we first separate the, uh, the graph from the, the structure representation and add a ultimate source and target node that connects to all the nodes on the inlet and outlet boundary respectively. Then we use one or some combination of the channel geometric characteristics as the edge weights changing the edge weight changes the predicted path. 
how well an edge weight performs is based on how well the shortest path matches with the known uh, mobile flow region. We found that the best edge weight is the arc length over pore throat. And from this, we can conclude that the preferential flow develops through the shortest pathway of interconnected channels when we measure short by the arc length over pore throat metric. To answer why paths form in these locations, we look to the network's structural organization. First, we took our graph and we separated it, um, the edges in the mobile flow region from the immobile flow region. Uh, note that the edge width definition we're using here is going to be the arc length over pore throat value. So this creates two subnetworks. And each subnetwork, we are interested in how structurally similar the adjacent edges are. We represented this by the variable RM for the mobile region and RIM for the immobile region. Here I'm showing the ratio of the mobile similarity to the immobile similarity plotted against the percolation threshold. The color indicates density here as this plot was populated with uh, over 3,600 uh, samples. In all cases, the ratio is greater than one, meaning that the similarity metric is greater for the mobile region relative to the immobile region. And demonstrated by the positive correlation, the ratio gets larger with percolation threshold, indicating that this contrast and structural similarity between the flow regions grows with flow heterogenization. Let's recap our findings from exploring the controls on flow. First, we used the percolation threshold to break the flow field into the mobile and immobile flow regions and ultimately quantify the flow heterogeneity. Next, we found that we can identify the percolating path with structural information alone, and that the spatial distribution of flow is caused by the internal structural similarity. Namely, the underlying percolating path is more structurally similar to itself than the rest of the sample. And this internal similarity increases with flow uh, heterogeneity. Next, we explore the controls flow has on other phenomena. Namely, we sought to see how flow, transport, and reaction interact. We explored this via simple dissolution reactions. And this leads us to first ask, how are dissolution reactions typically characterized and predicted? Conventionally, dissolution behavior is predicted using the dimensionless transport metrics in the form of a phase diagram. Uh, namely, we have the pecklet number, which uh, compares the advective to diffusive transport rates, and the kinetic number, which compares the diffusive to reaction rate. The most cited dissolution diagram from Golfier and co-authors studied the dissolution of granular salt samples and observed the following trends. At greater pecklet numbers, we expect to see uniform dissolution, where fresh reactant is carried away from the inlet and the reaction spreads throughout the sample. At very low pecklet numbers, we expect to see compact dissolution, where the porous medium is dissolving mostly where the injection occurs. When the transport and reaction timescales are better matched, we expect wormhole dissolution, where highly conductive channels are etched throughout the rock where all of the reaction occurs. To reiterate, this diagram was developed from observations of granular salt sample dissolution. The uniformity of the sample structure will, will result in a homogeneous flow field. However, real rock samples are rarely homogeneous. Let's plug in some uh, data from variably heterogeneous samples into Golfier's model. I'm going to be showing these points in the uh, solid markers. First, we plot the samples where we observe uniform dissolution. All of these samples are correctly classified uh, according to Golfier's diagram. Next, we plot the samples exhibiting compact dissolution and wormhole dissolution. And there is some apparent misclassifications. To explore how flow can influence this process, we first computed the, um, the percolation threshold for each of the geologic structures. The, as we've seen with the first project, the complexity of these samples structures can induce heterogeneous flow, and it's a possible cause for this misclassification. So shown here is a map of the pecklet numbers versus the percolation thresholds that we calculated for the geologic samples. Note that the salt structures all have an assumed percolation threshold of one because the flow field is very homogeneous. In this 2D view, we can completely separate the dissolution behaviors of the geologic structures. At the same time, the Golfier's original diagram completely separates the dissolution behaviors of the homogeneous salt structures. 
Expanding and combining the individual solutions gives us a three-dimensional phase diagram that completely separates all the behaviors, regardless of the underlying structural complexity. Thus, the spatial distribution of flow must be known in order to accurately predict the dissolution behavior. By exploring the control that flow has on other phenomena, we found that dissolution reactions are controlled by transport and reaction timescales, but the baseline hinges on flow heterogeneity and that we must account for flow heterogeneity in addition to transport and reaction to accurately predict the dissolution behavior. Now, I'd like to combine the lessons learned from these guiding questions to determine if changes in transport metrics can be directly tied to structural changes. To explore this connection, we will return to the 2D structures we discussed in the beginning. We are looking at one particular slice where we apply uniform erosion to the surface of all the grains. This maintains the topology of our structure while altering the geometry. We will be working with nine different erosion steps and we'll refer to each structure by its erosion step. So the label E01 refers to erosion step one, E05, erosion step five, and so on. Ultimately, through this work, we are trying to determine how uniform erosion impacts flow and transport. When we quantify the flow heterogeneity with the percolation threshold, we find that the flow field is initially becoming more homogeneous, then reverses to become more heterogeneous with erosion, the low point being at erosion step five. Now we will start to unpack the transport in the system, first with the breakthrough curve, which keeps track of how many particles are exiting the medium in time, and we expect that in homogeneous systems, the breakthrough curve will resemble a Gaussian or half normal distribution, and we will see heterogene heterogeneity manifest as long time tailing. In fact, when we measure the slope of the tail for each of the erosion steps, we find that from erosion step one to five, the late time scaling is increasing in magnitude, followed by a sharp decrease to erosion step nine. Here's that graph. And note that the, the graph in the corner that I'm showing has a y-axis that is negative. The greater magnitude slopes indicate the particles are exiting at a faster rate. Thus, by erosion step five, the particles are exiting relatively quickly compared to erosion step one and nine. In erosion step one and nine, we initially have a fast exiting of the particles, but the slower moving particles in the system take much longer to exit. This is because of the prominence of immobile flow regions in samples with greater percolation thresholds. Now we will continue probing the transport features in this system with the mean squared displacement, a measure of the deviation of a particle's position over time. At early times, we expect to see ballistic motion, and in late times, we expect to see either normal diffusion as defined by Fick's law or anomalous transport, either in the form of superdiffusion or subdiffusion. In advection-dominated systems, we expect the superdiffusion uh, in late time. However, a more complex flow field will result in stronger superdiffusion. After confirming that the ballistic regime is present in all of our samples, we compare the late time scaling. We found that from erosion step one to five, the late time scaling is approaching Fickian, followed by a sharp increase through erosion step nine. Thus, while particle transport is initially becoming more normal, it eventually shifts back to being non-Fickian. So there is a clear correlation between the evolution of flow heterogeneity and transport net metrics, but what is the cause? As the evolution of the pore space is the initiator of change in flow and transport, we return to structural analysis to find this answer. So we are going to return to our investigation of the pore space's structural organization. Remember, to do this, we first separate the edges in the mobile region from the immobile region. And after creating our two subnetworks, we measure how structurally similar adjacent edges are in terms of their arc length over pore throat metric. Then we plot the ratio of the mobile region similarity to the immobile region similarity. Oh, and that's shown here. In all cases, the ratio is greater than one, meaning that the similarity metric 
is greater in the preferential flow region relative to the immobile flow region. Initially, the similarity in the mobile region is getting weaker, indicating that the mobile region is less competitive or preferential relative to the rest of the sample. However, after our low point at erosion step five, the contrast and similarity between the regions is increasing with flow heterogeneity. This indicates that as we, that we can tie the changes in flow and transport uh, metrics to the structural changes. In the end, we have uncovered that a controlling factor for flow is the pore space structure and its local similarity, and that flow works in tandem with transport and reaction timescales to control dissolution behavior. Finally, we have made direct ties between the flow and transport metrics to structural changes. Now that we have identified the important small scale features, we need to figure out a way of how to scale it up and make these findings more applicable to solving problems related to groundwater remediation, oil recovery, and long-term carbon storage. But with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Zoe. Uh, very interesting talk. Um, I invite the audience to type down their questions in the comment box, and then we can read to the uh, for the yeah for the uh, answers. Uh, if um, anyone in the studio has questions, uh, as I see myself, I, I have a couple of questions. <laughs> if we have time, it's very interesting, Zoe. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, so uh, you, you had like this, you defined this metric for the shortest path, uh, uh, I guess, weighing the links uh, by the uh, arc length divided by pore throat, right? And then if I understood right, you found out that this one, um, if you if you found, found the shortest path using this metric, it correlated with the, the regions, with the mobile region, right? So, so with, with the points of like highest velocity. Is this result robust? regardless of the uh, pore structure, do you always find that the, the, this edge definition is the one that correlates with the... Yes, so we first defined, we, we first, in, in this first project that I was talking about, we were trying to find what is that quantitative link between the structure and flow. And so we were actually testing, I think, a total of 15 different combinations of different structural features. And we tested all of those different edge length definitions against a data set with about with 3,600 samples in it, or just around there. And so we were able to have a very large training set to confirm that this is very accurate for all of those samples mm. that we included. However, it is two-dimensional samples. In my second project, we tested this same theory of this kind of edge length definition on our three-dimensional samples with more complex structures. And it also held true for those samples as well. Oh, that's super interesting because it's a, uh, I can't really see like intuitively why this me this metric is the one that's uh, allows you to predict where the uh, mobile region would be. Uh, do people have like any intuitive reasoning for that or is it a surprising result? I don't think it's a surprising result necessarily. So when we think of, when we break it down into parts, we have the arc length. So that is the actual distance that is traveled along the topological skeleton. And so it, in theory, to get across a sample, you want to take a fairly short path in its traditional definition. But then when we consider the one over pore throat aspect, this is giving us a measure of resistivity. And it's easier to go through a pipe that is much wider than a pipe that is much smaller. However, it's not only this combination of having a short length and a wide pore throat. As we demonstrated with the similarity metric, we also need these, if we're going to call them a little bundle of uh, pipes going through our network, uh, these pipes need to be of a similar diameter and length. Uh, that is what's going to create this most uh, preferential flow region or primary flow path. Mm. Oh, super. Oh, that's excellent. And uh, so what, what kind of definition did, was used for the percolation threshold? Yeah. So, yeah, so the way that we go from the figure on the left to right is we first normalize our flow field by the average velocity. And so now we're working with a normalized flow field and we start our 
uh, process of finding this uh, percolation threshold by setting the percolation threshold to the maximum normalized velocity that we observe in our system. And so when we do that, uh, we are going to have only one point or one pixel in our entire medium that falls into this mobile region. We are iteratively lowering, lowering that percolation threshold until we find this continuous region from the left to right, the inlet to the outlet boundary. And so mm -hmm. that is what's going to be the indicator that we are going to stop this iterative search and decide that that is our percolation threshold. Right. So in this sense, it really is like a, like the like the word is used in percolation theory, like the threshold for which you have connectivity from uh, from from one side to the other. Exactly. Yeah, very nice. Super. Thank you. I have a quick question as well, if we have time. Um, I was just wondering, like, when you're going to, like, apply your results and upscale them, do you think that the way forward is to run simulations on the flow distributions that we get and use the simulator to get velocities? Um, or are you thinking of, like, a proxy for the velocity which we can get from, like, micro CT imaging? Um, so usually we don't get the velocity fields um, because we can't resolve for that. Um, yeah, that's my question. So I see a couple of applications of this work. So since we have figured out how to use the structure to identify where the fast flow regions are most likely going to be, we can circumvent the need for uh, numerical simulations to find that flow field if we're only interested in the first breakthrough, for example, and how fast that's going to be. Um, the other way that I see this work being applied is we have now identified this poor scale feature that is controlling flow and, and therefore transport at larger scales. And so I think that working this, uh, this small scale feature into a model like the continuous time random walk model would make us, would give us a better representation of the poor scale heterogeneity in term when we're talking about heterogeneity in terms of channeling it'll give us a better idea of what our small scale system looks like um i think that the i think that the best way of upscaling this is going to be trying to work in the similarity metric and into poor network modeling to then uh, cr to then have uh, simulations going through those poor network models. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, if there are no more questions, maybe we can move on to our next speaker. Um, so our next speaker is Hong Fan. Uh, she's a PhD student in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at the University of Minnesota, working with Professor Peter Kang. Uh, she is broadly interested in the flow and reactive transport in porous uh, and fractured media. Currently, uh, she is studying the density effect on the flow, transport, and mixing in the fractured media. Uh, the floor is, is yours, Hong Fan. Okay. So, hello, everyone. I'm Hong Fan Cao, a PhD student from the University of Minnesota. I'm working with Professor Peter Gang, and I'm very glad to have the chance to show our work about the emergence of Fox flow and instability in vertical fractures induced by variable density flows. So what I'm showing here is a very interesting phenomenon when we uh, injected uh, two fluids with different density into a vertical fracture. And the, we found uh, the lighter fluid is confined uh, to a narrow path and the narrow path is very unstable. In this talk, I will talk about the emergence of this uh, Fox flow path and the instability of the, of the flow path. So first of all, let me give some background information. Vertical fractures are very common in subsurface fracture system and many variable density fluids flow occur in this vertical fracture. For example, in the seawater intrusion in the coastal fractured aquifer, like in this vertical fracture, there are, uh, uh, there are lighter fluid, fresh water, and also salt water in this vertical fracture. So there will be variable density flows. And also it will happen uh, during CO2 sequestration because it has denser water and lighter CO2. Um, due to density effect, the density contrast of two fluids will affect the fracture 
the flow structure of the system, which is impacted to the transport and the sol of solute and mixing of fluids. And the solute transport and mixing will in further affect the density contrast between two fluids. So there is a complex coupled flow process between uh, because of the density effects. However, the density effects in vertical fracture are not well studied. So recently, a lab experiment was performed at Purdue University in which uh, two fluids with different density were injected into a fracture. The formation of the... So here, two videos shows the experiment result. The first video shows when the vertical is horizontal and the second video shows when the fracture is vertical. And the formation of the unstable ronglet is, is observed in the experiment when the vertical when the fracture is vertical, but it, can, it cannot be observed in horizontal fracture. The follow sorry, the follow up experiment. So the follow up experiment about reactive fluids show the formation of the ronglet has huge impact on the precipitation pattern in the fracture. As we can see from these two videos, when the fracture is horizontal, uh, the precipitation uh, the, the precipitation distribution is very uh, even. But when the fracture is vertical, the precipitation only occurred uh, around the wrong lat. Precipitation is not the fox of today's talk. I'm just want, I just want to emphasize the importance of the study about the unstable ronglet. What we want to understand in this study are the mechanisms triggering the unstable ronglet and the factors controlling the instability. So what did we do? We used the open form to do the 3D numerical simulation and try to reproduce what we observed in the experiment. The governing equation we used here are the never stocks equation combined with the direction diffusion equation. And we also applied the Bosinux approx approximation to make the sim simulation easier. And the model setup is similar with the experiment. We successfully reproduced the unstable runlet in the numerical simulation, as we can see from the first figure. However, when we change the density of the two fluids as the same, the narrow uh, ronglet disappears, as we can see from the second uh, row of figures. It means the density contrast between the injected and ambient fluid can be the, sorry, can be the origin of the ronglet. And, and at the interface of the, two, of the two fluids, mixing can happen and reduce the density contrast between the two fluids, right? So what will happen if there is a strong mixing between the two fluids and the density contrast is highly reduced? To answer this question, we simulated several cases with different diffusion coefficients. Higher diffusion coefficient means the two fluids can mix better. Results show the wrong light disappear uh, when the diffusion coefficient is large. Only when the diffusion coefficient is small enough, the wrong light appears. And when the diffusion coefficient is even smaller, the wrong light becomes unstable. It confirms the importance of the density contrast on the formation of the unstable wrong light. So now we know the origin of the wrong light, but what is the origin of the instability? If we look into the 3D streamlines, we can see many what vortices like this uh, along the wrong lat. It seems the vortices lead to the instability of the wrong lat, but the 3D flow field is too complex to analyze. So we use the topology analysis to extract important information from the complex flow field. What we are interested in are these stagnation points shown as a red dot in the figure. The flow pattern around these stagnation points look like this. So these stagnation points can be used to represent the center of vortices. Then we plot the number of stagnation points and the length of the runlet with time. We found they have the same tendency. 
It shows this what states do affect the instability of the wrong light. Uh, let's look into more details. This video shows 3D concentration distribution. If we choose a cross section like this and zoom into the area around the wrong light, we can see there is a high concentration gradient between the wrong light and the surrounding fluid. And the high velocity gradient can also be observed around the wrong light. High velocity gradient can cause the instability known as kevin hemholtz instability. And the high concentration gradient can also lead to relative instability. But what is the reason of the vortices along the wrong light? To investigate the two possible reasons of the vortices, dimensionless number analysis was performed. We calculated the Richardson number of our system, which is the dimensionless number that shows when the kevin hemholtz instability occur. However, the Richardson number in our system is much larger than the critical Richardson number, which means the vortices are not caused by the kevin hemholtz instability. Then we calculated the relay number, which is the dimensionless number that shows when the relay taylor instability occur. We found the relay number in our system is much larger than the critical relay number, so we thought it's relatively instability that leads to the vortices. And let's look into the 3D streamlines again. We can, from this video, we can uh, clearly observe the upward movement of the vortices. And here we draw a simple figure to show how the vortices occur and how the vortices move up. At the very early stage, uh, when the dye, when the denser fluid goes into the fracture because of the drag force of injected lighter fluid, the denser fluid will go up. But because the denser fluid, because of the density difference, the denser fluid will tend to move down. So that leads to a first vortices occur along, along the near the inlet. The, then at the third stage, uh, because of the upward movement of the lighter fluid and it push up the vortices, the vortices will go up and it leads to it. Uh, then there is there are more space for another vortices to occur. At the last stage, we can observe this kind of many vortices and the upward movement of vortices. And uh, as we just discussed, the upward movement of vortices seems related to the fluid inertia force. So we did the simulation, use only the stagnation, or use only the Stokes equation, which neglect the fluid inertia to study the effects of fluid inertia. And here are the uh, results. We found uh, when we neglecting the inertia effect, the vortices only occur near the inlet, and we can observe the wrong uh, the, the, the wrong light near the inlet is also instable. So the fluid inertia can affect the movement of the vortices and change the characteristics of the wrong light. In fractures, flow velocity can be varied, and the fluid inertia changes with flow rate. So we simulated a case with smaller injection rate of lighter fluid, and the results show the injection rate can control the wavelength of the wrong light by affect the size of what stays near the wrong light. In nature, most fractures have rough walls, so we also studied the emergence of wrong light in rough fractures. We used two different uh, geometry of the rough fracture to do the simulation. We found the wrong light is also present in the rough fracture, but the wrong light characteristics are sensitive to fracture roughness and injection location. After the numerical simulation in a single fracture, we also want to study the effects of density-driven flow in fracture network. So we used this film to, did the, to do the 3D virtual experiment. We generated a 3D fracture network in this room, 
And when the fresh water flows from the inlet to the outlet, we inject it dye from this uh, import in injection point and observe the movement and observe the movement of the dye. And this figure shows what we used to generate the fracture network. This uh, transparent, we use these transparent blocks to represent uh, the impermeable matrix. And we use this frame as the space between matrix to generate a constant fracture aperture between matrix. So like we can see here, we combined several, uh, in, in, uh, we combined several transparent uh, blocks and place the space between them to generate the, the uh, fracture between these transparent blocks. And then we put these uh, blocks layer by layer to generate horizontal fractures. And this video shows uh, what we observed in the experiment. The flow rate we use is about three centimeters per second. And we injected dye from here. And we can see the dye move uh, along the horizontal fracture first. And when it reach the intersection, like uh, through the vertical fracture, And what we are interested, uh, what we are interested, uh, is what we observed from at the intersection. We found uh, many die will be trapped in this uh, intersection, like we can see here. And if we zoom in, we can see the vertical, uh, the vertical flow at the intersection. And the vertical flow can be observed more clear from this uh, video. So we've, uh, we've found the density contrast lead to appear appearance of presented vertices at fracture intersections. At the intersection, there are two uh, force that will lead to the vertices. One is the injection force between the vertical and the horizontal flow. And another reason is the density effects because the denser is the dry the dye is denser than the fresh water, so it tends to go down. But the fresh water from the horizontal fracture will tend to move up at the intersection. So that leads to the vortices at the intersection. And what we are doing now is we did a simulation to compare the density effects and the injection, uh, the density effects and the injection force. And we found uh, the, the, M, the, we found the different combination of the density effects and the injection force can lead to different phenomena at the intersection. But this study is still ongoing. And here are our, our conclusions. And I'm glad to answer questions. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for your talk. Um, if any of the audience have any questions, please just type them in, in the chat and we can ask them. Uh, we're getting some last PM there. Uh, so I have a question um, just while people like formulate their ideas. It seems like when you have this runlet um, compared to the horizontal structure, you see different time scales, like not just different patterns for the solution. But it seems like the time scales that the uh carrying over change. And is this something that you've looked into or quantified in any way? Sorry, I cannot hear you very clearly. Can you repeat your question again? Um, I was saying that when you have the two different types of fractures, mm -hmm. uh the time scales, so like short uh period dynamics or like very long dynamics, mm -hmm. seems to differ depending on the fracture orientation. And is this something that you've looked into? So you mean um, in the fracture network? If you like go back to the case where you had the horizontal fracture versus the uh, vertical fracture, I think maybe that would. Oh, you mean this one? No, like at the very, very beginning. 
Oh, the very, oh, you mean? Sorry. You mean the experiment about the precipitation, like? two videos yeah it seems like the the time over which the dynamics are occurring uh is very very different and i was wondering if the time scales were something that you've looked at um so in this two uh in this experiment the two the fluids are injected as a uh so the they used the same injection rate for these two experiments. Mm -hmm. So the time scale is uh, similar. You, uh, we observed this difference is because at the first uh, um, experiment, the fracture is horizontal, which means this um, angle of the inclination is uh, zero. So the flow will goes uh, into the, uh, will flow from the inlet to the outlet more easier. Uh, when the fracture is vertical because it's injected from the down uh, bottom to the up so we can uh, so it seems it flows slower slower than the fracture is horizontal but actually it's the same time scale um so like the flow rates are the, are the same but when you look at these videos the one on the left everything looks like it happens very quickly <laughs> Whereas yeah. on the right, you have this like interface moving, which looks slow, but then you also have yeah. these like turbulent eddies, which look a lot quicker. And so I feel like if you took say the saturation of these images, so like the color of these images, or if you had like a pressure measurement for these experiments, you would see different types of dynamics dominating for the, the two. And I feel like that's something that would be interesting to look at. Yeah. Um. Uh, can, 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 can I ask a question? Yeah. So Hong Kong, yeah, this is super interesting. I was uh, I was wondering uh, this. Uh, so the case on the right here, this image, this looks a lot like the the wake of a candle. You know, when when we, when we blow a candle and the like the, the smoke goes up and then before uh, it becomes completely turbulent, there is this little region that is a bit linear and then you have like the oscillations that's probably caused by vortex shedding as well. Have you ever seen if there is any kind of comparison between these runlets and the, the dynamics of, of the candle smoke? Mm. You know, do you know what I mean? If you just like a blow a candle and then you look at the smoke above it, you have it uh, hot air moving up, right? Because of the candle, because yeah. of the flame. And then uh, surrounding is like an ambient temperature air. So you have like a, a density a, a driven process, like different density of, of the air. So in a way it's somewhat similar here, but then because of the smoke you can see, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so this looks a little bit like an underwater candle wake. I'm asking because uh, I've seen like a paper where people study like this kind of like instability of uh, of, of candle of the flame actually, and uh, it might be somewhat connected to this this kind of like a vortex shedding uh, that leads to the, the 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 oscillations that you have you have shown. So I was just wondering if anyone has like put this kind of like a problems in, in parallel to one another. Yeah, very interesting points. We. Uh, we didn't think about this before, but um, yeah, we can um, do more research about this, like uh, read more paper about like this. Maybe we can find <laughs> some um, similarity between these two phenomena. It might be similar. It might be the, the, the same thing, like uh, just that, uh, I don't know if this, these experiments are, are basically 2D, right? The fracture creature is uh, a range from two millimeter to four millimeter, but I think it's three D experiment. Okay, yeah, so if yeah. it's three D, it will be even even more similar, I think. Yeah, it really looks like a candle wake underwater. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got a question. 
uh, that could be a kind of follow-up question for from Catherine's question. Uh, how long did you continue the experiments? Because uh, like at the right experiments that you're showing, uh, there is a dark blue. And like if I, I assume if you continue the left experiment long enough, you probably get to the same color density. Uh, have you tried to run them like for a uh, very long time to see how long it will take to like set and get to the same stage of the experiments or something like that? Yes, um, the experiment is not the main project we did. What we focus on, what we focus on as the simulations, but our collaborator did the experiment uh, for a long time and and. It actually it reached a kind of steady state after some uh, time step, after some uh, time, after few like few minutes. And what I'm showing here from uh, I'm showing here from this video is actually reach about to reach the steady state. So like the interface of the dark and dark blue won't move up forever okay okay thank you great well and thank we, you so you much. can see um, from the later stage the interface move up very very slowly it's almost not moving okay great thank you um it seems like this is all we have time for. So I think it is time to wrap up the session. Let me just bring Zoe back. I want to thank both our speakers for their excellent talks today. Um, and then just a note for everyone who's watching to just hit subscribe and then you guys will see uh, the information for uh, the next talk, which will be next month. So a big thank you again to our speakers and a huge thank you to everyone who's a part of the Porous Media Tea Time Talks shown on this slide. Uh, we are looking forward to seeing you next time. And if you wish to present or you want to nominate a speaker to present, then you can email us here on this email. So, yeah, once again, thank you and see you guys uh, next month. Thank you.